Message that will challenge us with persistence in prayer and faith. You got to persist in it. And I, the reason why I would say persist in it is because so many times we get caught up in living and we get mad when things don't go our way. We sometimes get frustrated and we say, oh shoot, or something stronger. Huh? <laughs> we say something. I'm just telling the truth in church. I wouldn't lie to you in church. We, we say some things out of the Sunday school book. Uh, but the point of the matter is, we are living in time. And someone says time is motion, is, is, is always in movement. Time is always in movement. So there come a moment when we're high, there come a moment when we're low, there come a moment when we're kind of mediocre. And we have to constantly be encouraged every day. That's why the Lord says morning by morning, new mercies. Because we, are, we, are, we need new mercy. One morning we're good, one morning we might not be good. One morning the things might be bad and we might stay in the bed or rebel against society. You just don't know what's going on. So we have to be encouraged. So when I say persistence, uh, God has to kind of, we have to kind of feed and nurture ourselves with the Word of God, just like eating those greens. If you want to be strong, if you want to be healthy, you got to do some things. Uh, that necessarily may not taste good, but they're good for you. Is that right? And so there are things in life that we disdain, but no, rather never do. But yet we got to come to the point where we encourage ourselves in the Lord. Amen. So I just want to say that that word is for us to nurture, to eat, to give us this day our daily what? Bread. We need the bread. It's the word. And Jesus is that word. And we need that word constantly because Everything, our mind is changing, our, our thoughts are changing, everything is in movement. And you go through life and you see, well, you were once young, and now you're old, huh? But never have I seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That, that element of truth inspires your heart, amen? And I understand why um, uh, when you get young, old folks would sit and tell stories, and, and they take so long because I wanted to get out and play. Uh, Amen. Uh, come on, hurry up with the punchline. And they go over something. Oh, that wasn't that. But I said, oh. <laughs> now I'm old. I love to tell the story. <laughs> well, we got to be patient. Is that right? Yes. And when life requires a degree of patience. We're going to look tonight at, uh, as we go to, let's go to the book of Mark. And at Mark, I believe it will be chapter 9. And we're going to look there at what I think is um, a very good passage of Scripture. It'll be Mark chapter 9, nine around 14. All right? All right. And this is going to present a story about Jesus. Amen? And Jesus with a father who had a son and we might call him epileptic or uh, deaf and dumb. But he had a spirit. Jesus had been on the Mount of Transfiguration, and when he came down, he came down to deal with this issue. And this issue confronted him. So we want to look at that tonight in Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. If you haven't said amen. 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 So we thank God tonight. He says here, come on in, dig a right. Amen. We can play in Brother Marti, been here all day, uh, all morning and all day, uh, taking care of uh, watching the painters, making sure they don't mess up your church. Oh, Amen. Yes, Thank and they have gotten along well with the painters, and we got uh, things done. So I want to thank them. Yes. Special thanks to them because yes. they've been working hard. Yes. But let's go now to our passage in Mark chapter nine, verse fourteen. And when he came to his disciples, well, since after he comes off the Mount of Transfiguration, no doubt he is glowing and sparkling with the Shekinah presence of God. So when he came down, the people were, ah, yeah. ooh. It was a, a thing that we just wasn't strolling down. He'd been in the presence of God. Who else had been in the presence of God and shone with the brightness of God? Who was that? Uh -huh. Moses. Moses had been on the mountain, and when he came, his face shone as in the presence of God. So Jesus would surely shine. Amen. So Jesus comes down, and when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them. Who was the multitude consistent of? That the scribes questioning with them. So he was a curious position. His disciples had been interrogated by scribes and Pharisees 
and Herodians and whomever else. In other words, religious leaders. If you saw somebody interrogating your children, you won't know what y'all doing. What you, you ask me? Is that what we say? Yeah. You'll be asking about this. That's right. So Jesus would say, <clears throat> and straightway all the people, when they beheld him, now that lets you know something was unusual about him. When they beheld him, were greatly what? Amazed. That's movement here. Greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. What is that like? Jesus comes out of the Mount of Transfiguration. He suddenly appears. They were waiting for him, but he comes quicker than they thought he was coming. And wow, he's amazed. He's beautiful. He's gorgeous. He's, he's shining. Amen. They were amazed about something. It wasn't just Peter with a beard, huh? Looking like uh, one of those basketball players, Patty, Patty Mills, about. <laughs> Jesus was glowing, and that was what was amazing. And so they had to stop and ama be amazed, amen? And they saluted him, and he asked the scribes, Jesus asked the scribes, what question, or why are you questioning them? Amen? And one of the multitude, which was the boy's father, answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Mm. And wheresoever he taketh him, he tarreth him. And he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth with it. He was drawn. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, mm -hmm. but they could not. Yeah. It's a sad time here. Yeah. This is a sad time because the church or the deacons or the disciples, whomever you want to call them, the believers were put to the test and they tried to call that unclean spirit out or heal him with prayer. We don't know what they did, but they did pray. It didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work. What do you do when your first prayer doesn't work? That's exactly the right answer. Because when your first prayer doesn't work, you got to persist. And persisting means keep at it. And it doesn't mean get mad. Now this ain't your mom you're dealing with, huh? <laughs> this is Jesus. Uh, we used to turn tantrums when we didn't get what we wanted. Is that right? Mom said, I'll beat you up so and so, huh? Uh, you, got, you got a little judgment with that, accountability. And we get grown, nobody talk back to us. But Jesus said, he wanted to, this, this, he, he taught this lesson. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration with God. That way he knew what was going on. He didn't ask to find out what was going on. He asked to put a paint a picture and step in the middle of it and teach him a lesson. Why are you talking about my disciples? And the father said, Master, I brought my son to thee. He has a spirit, a deaf and dumb spirit. He foamed at the mouth, he gnashed with the teeth, and he pined the way. And I brought a real disciple, and they couldn't do nothing. You know how we do. We put our body in it. They couldn't do, is that what we said? <laughs> nothing. Is that what we said? No, uh, we get mad, we say it like that. We don't say they didn't do nothing. We say they didn't do nothing. Huh? I'm ready to fight you. That's our culture. I'm bringing you culture too here. Yeah. All right, we talk with our body. We're very physical. We're animated. And so he said they didn't do nothing. Isn't that right? And so that's disappointing. Disappointing to Jesus. Disappointing to the Father. Disappointing to the crowd. And when the disciples, when the scribes and Pharisees saw that the disciples did not, could not do anything, they taunted them. Can you imagine what they would be talking about in a crowd like we have today? Mm. I thought you were supposed to be so holy. Uh, Is that us? Yeah, so, yeah that's right. <laughs> so, like somebody at the table with a can of slits in their hand. <laughs> that's what our relatives, you know how we are. They back over there. They want to talk about you and to run down somebody. So this was embarrassing. It was an embarrassing moment. But now Jesus to the rescue. All right? All right? And he says, he answered them and said to them, Oh, faithless what? Generation. He didn't just say he said generation. All of y'all. Yeah. I'm talking, in other words, I've been with you so long, I've taught you the right way, and you still don't know. You got to go many ways to deal with evil. And you don't try, you don't give up on the first prayer. Y'all better listen to me. Get sick, don't give up on the first prayer. You're in the hospital, they said we got to go get the test. Oh, hurry and get the test. Don't give up. 
Yeah. On the first prayer. Yeah. Amen. You say you say that prayer many times as it takes to get your faith up. Amen. Mm -hmm. And when your faith is up, don't then leave it. Amen. In other words, leave it at that level and trust God. Amen? Yes. But these disciples had prayed. I don't know how they prayed. It was nine of them there. Nine preachers, they couldn't get up. Well, they couldn't hear one more. It was embarrassing. So that was Tommy. And Jesus said, oh, faithless. Faithless. Listen what he's saying. Faithless. Persisting in your faith and your prayer. Prayer is not enough sometimes. Is that right? Well, let me put it this way. One prayer is not enough, Amen. particularly if that prayer does not have faith. Amen. Sometimes we pray just we just God. Amen. Huh? Amen. But we got to pray with faith. And faith is really sincerity. Yes. And I like to say that when you come into God, you got to admit you nothing. Amen. I don't think your prayer gets really any petitioning heard until you come to the essence of what you are about. Lord, I don't have nothing. Amen. Lord, I'm nothing. Lord, I can't do nothing. Lord, I'm guilty. But have mercy on me. God wants you to get to the end, the lowest common denominator, of where you are. And I think that's what he was saying. Oh, faithless. Is that what he's saying? Yeah. Faithless generation. He brought them down to a zero. Faithless means zero faith. Now he's going to have to deal with it. Okay. How long? He had a question behind that. Not only are you zero, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I permit you, suffer with you, and, and suffer you? And then you try to pause right there, because that was the end of the question. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It's like having a class and going over multiplication titles for six weeks, and then asking what six, what, six times six. And someone said, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you can't be violent. But the whole idea is the frustration level. Yes. Goes up when you have taught and taught and taught oh, yes. and taught, and they still, no, no, no. amen. Mm -hmm. So the Lord at that level, isn't that nice to know Deacon Ray that, that he got frustrated like we do? Mm -hmm. Isn't that nice to know Deacon James when you told somebody something through yeah. the drive through and they didn't get it right? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and they still ain't got it right. Jesus got frustrated too. Yeah. He didn't blow his stack. He didn't blow his cool. What did he say next? So in the third movement, he bring said, bring him to me. To me. To bring him to me. Bring him unto me. In other words, boy. Boy. So we're like sheep. Sheep don't have good memory. And they can't reason and ration. And if they fall on their back, they can't get up. Huh. Rightly did he call us sheep. Because we can't, when we get lost, we can't figure out where we are. If we get turned on our back, we can't help. Huh? We can't get up. And we don't have any decision making ability except, uh, uh, huh? Yeah. <laughs> the Lord called us, He didn't call us, they didn't call us dog got a bit of favor. Because Fido can sniff his way home, yeah. <laughs> uh, hide his bone, uh, defend the yard, and hop up and quill up in your lap. A dog is, is better than a sheep. But dog doesn't have good lamb chops. So. Yeah. <laughs> The Lord called us sheep. So he said, bring the boy to me. Bring the boy to me. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How long? Well, let me refer, let me refer on. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway, the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and waddled for him. Mm. Now, this was something more than sickness. Some de demons know that they're in the presence of God. Mm. Demons know when they fix to get a word. Uh, Deacon, demons, rather, I said demons. Civil <laughs> <laughs> talking. No demons intended here. Demons. We have fun tonight. Demons know when they're in the presence of God. Jesus went into the temple before this one, and the demon said, What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? The demons knew straightway Jesus was there. When the demons were in the halls, or got into the I was in the demonic man. And then they got into the hall. They knew you don't send us out of the country. We love the country. They know when they're in the presence of God. So here Jesus said, Jesus, the demon is listening down in the boy. And the Lord Jesus now is getting ready to cure. And he, and he said, bring him to me. The demon, the demon said, oh. Mm. You going to where? And Jesus over there. He taking him. So what did they do? The last act of what they could do. Doing something evil. 
They got in the boy. They made him convulse. They made him foam at the mouth. They made him really show out that night. Isn't that something? Demons, when they get ready to leave, they, they want to mess up something. Is that right? Yeah. Tell y'all about the lady when I was on the bus at the youth convention years ago in the 70s in Houston, Texas. I offered one of the one of the matrons some drinking water. She didn't want any water, but she wanted to mess up my water. Mm -hmm. I'm telling the truth. I was a youth, and she was a matron, and she was high up in the hierarchy of the matrons at New Life Baptist Church. I'm telling the truth. I don't care if I tell the story. It's true. I can stand on the truth any time. I'm not trying to demean anybody. I'm just telling you what happened as a youth. So I was trying to be nice because Houston water was not like aquifer water. Yeah. We had San Antonio aquifer water. It's better to taste it. So I said, would you like some water? And she said, no, no. And I went on to someone else. She said, wait, come here, but bring that back. And her old greasy hands was eating some chicken. <laughs> I'm telling the truth. She said, take the top off the thermos. It was a thermos. I took the top off, she stuck her hand. And rinsed her hand. Oh, no. In my drinking water. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm standing in the church. I wouldn't lie. <laughs> this was a matron at the church. And I almost had to count to 10,000. <laughs> She, I said, why did you do that? And one of the other ladies said, oh, that was so ugly. And at that moment, it was the spirit of God, Sister James, that kept me from taking that thermos. <laughs> 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 the spirit had to grab me. Huh? And I was young and foolish. I don't know how the spirit held me down. I was young and foolish. But the spirit of God said, don't do it. Spirit of God said, don't do it. I told my brother, I said, I want to go upside, I want to go ahead. <laughs> That's what I felt like. I'm telling the truth. I wasn't going to do it, but I felt like it. And he said, don't worry about it. We can just get some more water. Just rinse it out and get some more water. Very practical older brother. Thank you for all the older brothers. I tell the young ones to sit down and be still. That very evening, after they finished the session, they elected me president of the state. Mm -hmm. Now, how bad it looked that yeah. your new president, but I didn't whoop somebody. <laughs> <laughs> God knows how to fix it. Yes, he if he can't fix it, it can't be fixed. But he can fix it. Amen? Now, I want to get to this part here where the, the, it gets down to the nitty gritty. He asked his father how long, and he told him, and he, brought, he said, all times have cast him to the fire. This was a serious ailment, and we call it epilepsy. It could be many other things, too, but we, we get a picture of it. And he cast him into the water to destroy him. And here's what I want to get to. I'm in verse 22. Verse 22 is the real turning point of the scripture and the whole lesson. Do you see that disjunctive conjunction? But if, is that what he says? Did your Bible say but if? But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. His faith, his spirit, his prayer had been so shaken, he didn't realize he was talking to Jesus. It had been so tampered with, and he was so frustrated by the disciples' inability to cure his son. When he brought his son, I brought him. Now do something. They didn't do nothing. He was mad. <laughs> Is that right? You stand in the emergency waiting room a long time, and somebody gets in front of you, you get mad. I'm telling the truth. They say, we triage him. Well, triage me. <laughs> we have to come to that point, and the Lord has to tell us something. So Jesus, when, when he was this boy, this man, was upset with the disciples. But if you can do anything, and you don't use a supposition with Jesus, the question is not if I can do anything. The question is if you believe I can do anything. As to what I can do is settle. What do you believe? Yeah. See, that was the issue here. The issue wasn't what God could do. The issue was what do you believe I can do? And oftentimes our, our faith and our prayer life didn't test it until God says, it's not what I can do, it's what you believe I can do. I can do all things are possible to them that what? Believe. believe. You gotta believe. You gotta plan it in your heart. You just can't 
expect it to be something mechanical. Walk up to the Lord, pull me out a blessing. The Lord said, you got why is your predicate of belief? Do you believe in who I am? You just don't get the blessing. You got to believe. And you got to persist in your faith. Is that right? And the Lord did what? What happened? He said, and straightway the father of the child cried out and said unto him in tears. With tears. With tears. You suppose self-examination went before this, this statement because he was with tears. Lord, I believe, help thou my I'm convoluted. I'm conflicted. I believe a little over here, but I don't believe the total picture. I get upset sometimes, and I get weary and weary and tired, and I don't know what to believe sometimes. Help my unbelief. So he's saying, I really want to believe, but I haven't arrived at the belief level. I just got a little. And the Lord says, I can take the little and make much out of it. See, that's why we have to, we have to consist. New believers, newcomers in Christ, those who start on the journey, don't know that it takes patience to wait on God. It takes patience to develop an experience with God. And if you kind of come to God and think he's going to work in a New York second, and he's going to move automatically, you haven't learned God. God will make you wait. He made Moses wait 40 years. And he'll make all of us wait as long as he pleases. Because he's not in a hurry. Somebody said that God is not in a hurry. Mm. We may be in one, but he's not in one. And you got to wait. You got to wait. Somebody used to say, I heard this, a stared pot can't boil. Y'all never heard that? Mm -hmm. Looking at the pot won't help the water. Yeah. It got to hit the temperature right. So you're looking at it, won't help it. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And that's what, the, what was going on here. The man said, with tears. You know, this had to bring him to tears. The Lord says, I, that's what I can do. That's seven. What do you believe I can do? And he cried. Lord, I, I believe that help, help my unbelief. Isn't that something? God is patient with us. To those who come to him, he will in no wise cast them out. He didn't cast them out. He endured him and told him, bring me the boy. And after he brought him the boy, amen. And he said, and but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted it up, and what happened? He arose. Yeah. He was ill. The, the demons had done all they could. And then when the disciples went to Jesus and said, why couldn't we do this? And he said, this kind. Watch that. Is that what he said? Mm -hmm. This kind. I'm in verse 29. Mm -hmm. This kind. Do you know your own kind? We don't still used to hate those things. Y'all's kind, huh? We're the kind part. It ain't been too nice, is it? But Jesus was referring to the devils here and the demons. This kind of demon, huh, can come forth by nothing but by what? Prayer. Prayer. She's going to say it. And fasting. Amen? By prayer and fasting. So there are some kinds of demons that are sent to make you sick. Sickness, not all sickness is because you got a body. Sometimes the devil wants to make you sick, throw some sickness at you. When Job was in a contest, or God, the devil was in a contest with, with the devil over Job, Job was what? He was made sick by the demon. Is that right? He visited, the demon came and visited him and put balls all over him. If that wasn't enough, he made him put balls, they gave him sunken face, his got, eyes got dark, his breath got stinging. Everything yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, that's what the, oh, the writers say. Yeah. Nobody want to be around Joe. Oh, Joe, his wife said, get on out the house. Yeah. 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 Lord Jesus. Why don't you curse God and what? Yeah. I got double in the devil and the devil. Yeah. She was looking for him to go. Mm -hmm. And Joe said, you talk like one of the what? Foolish women. Yeah. Yeah. Haven't we received good of God? Can we not receive a test? Well, he didn't necessarily mean evil, but a test. The demon came to make Job afflicted. And in this case, the demon came to make the little boy afflicted. And we all the other story of the Psychrophoenician woman, because she was grievously vexed with a what? Demon, and she was at home, and her mother was there, Psychrophoenician, a Greek woman of the Hematic descent from the tribe, the uh, nation of Phoenicia, uh, which Ham's people set in. So she was coming along, and she was a dark woman. And Jesus didn't have nothing to do with her, neither did the disciples. But she persisted, is that right? Mm -hmm. I don't care if you don't like me, my daughter is sick. Yeah. 
Can we let some things roll off if we decide to? Yes. Amen? Do we have to get mad and swear and cuss at everything? No. Amen? Yeah. Somebody just did that on the way over here. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> Amen? But you don't have to. You don't have to. And when you do so, just ask the Lord to forgive you. I'm helping somebody. Oh, yeah, yeah. And get back into the spirit of what God wants to do. God does not cut off your blessing because you cut somebody out. How many know that? Mm -hmm. Amen? Okay. Amen? That's going to help somebody. Get them out of here that way. Because if we cut off all our blessings, it's because none of us. <laughs> Practically none of us. Help none of us. Mary Helen will get blessed because she don't do that. Huh? <laughs> but none of us would get blessed if God held every sin against us yeah. and said, I refuse to bless you yeah. until you get rid of all you have zero balance in your sin account. Uh -huh. Our sin account has gone through the roof and God is still blessed us. Yeah. Which is a reason to stay with God. Because after you go off, you still got to deal with the problem. But if you go off and ask God to forgive you and give it over to God, God can make it better. God healed Job, gave him double of what he had, took the Psychophoenician's daughter and woke her up, and then took this man's little boy, whom he loved dearly, and raised him up. You see what God can do? When we persist, our problem is we don't want to do long what we need to do long. That's why the fruit of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit's presence in us, is called long-suffering. Because patience is nothing more than something stepping on your last nerve, and you got to endure. I want to do evil, but I won't do it. Amen? Amen. You ever been to those crossroads? Mm -hmm. I sure want to do something, Lord. Mm -hmm. I sure could have taken that thermostat. And cooled off that sister that day. <laughs> and I'd have started with her hair. I wouldn't have started with her lap break. I'd have messed up her hair. You messed up my water, I'm gonna start at the top of you. Your hair is fixed night. Here it go. <laughs> but I didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, don't say I'm that mean, sister. I'm not that mean. I didn't do it, y'all. Yeah. And because I didn't do it, God promoted me that very day. Amen. Amen. I know he did. Amen. I know he did. So I'm here to tell you that the Lord wants you to persist. When the first prayer, what do you do when the first prayer doesn't work? Pray again. Pray and again fast. and fast. Yeah. Because he said, this kind. And somebody said he, he was talking to some of these devils of, of men, huh? Mm -hmm. get the, the fact that this was a he. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's something he said, so the preacher said the other day, there's some devils in the sheep. <laughs> well, whatever they are, they're devils. Yeah. I don't care, man or woman. Yeah. Jezebel or uh, anybody, you have got to rebuke the devil and then fast. Now what happens when you fast? Why is fasting such a key point? Why is fasting such a key point that it would take fasting to get that level of devil out? You cleanse the tension of fasting. It does what now? I, I believe you get the tension of fasting. Yes, I believe it brings you into a more serious level of self-examination and brings you to a consciousness that which God is on. God is on a conscious level, and you need to get on that level of humility. Becoming, remember, zero. Lord, I'm nothing. And I say, it's good. You've gotten the lesson. I'm nothing. I'm not. I'm zero. And God says, now, now I can begin to build on you because you've come down to your lowest level. Fasting, I believe, brings you to the consciousness of, I don't want to sin. I have sinned. And I'm sorry for the sin I've committed, and I don't want to do it again, Lord. Mm. That's what fasting brings you. Godly sorrow with an attitude toward change and determination. <coughs> Is that right? Fasting and prayer. And those, though that combination together must be like a boom, boom, huh? You don't do the right cross till you get the left jab going. Mm -hmm. You get the left jab going, huh? And he's looking for that, he, boom, huh? Yeah. That's what you do with the devil. Amen. You knock him out with that fasting. Because he's not looking for that. Something about fasting. Otherwise, the Lord wouldn't have told him the secret of boxing with the devil. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with a demon. So this kind does not come out until you pray and pray hard and pray again and fast. Amen. Amen. So don't let the sickness overwhelm you because you haven't fasted yet. Amen. Mm -hmm. Don't let the problems overcome you 
because you really haven't fasted yet. But when you fast, I don't care if you fast for one meal. I'll say that again. Because some people think they get, you need to fast from 6 to 6. And that's all right. If you can go from 12 hours, you do that. But I have learned in my little short span of life that even if you fast through the meal you love the most, that may be breakfast, that may be lunch, that may be fish dinner over the place, huh? Whatever it is, you let it go. Mm -hmm. And in as much as you dedicate your life to God during that time you would be eating, you afflict your soul. That's what it says. The Bible calls it afflicting your soul. God sees that and looks at that as a valuable thing. Amen? Mm -hmm. So the disciples had to learn something. The father of the son of the young boy had to learn something. And the boy invariably learned from his father that he had a demon, and the only way the demon got out, Jesus said, was for them to fast and pray. Mm -hmm. I suppose that little boy had a lot of things to learn and share when he got over. Yes. But I was possessed with the demon. Mm -hmm. I had that, that demon tore me up and foamed, make me foam at the mouth. Everybody was looking at me at school. Nobody would touch me. And then the Lord healed me one day mm -hmm. and made me known. Mm -hmm. Woo! Oh, Thank you, Lord. Yes. God wants to do that. God loves you that much. Persist in your prayer and then don't get afraid to fast, even if it's through what it to say one meal. Just do that one meal thing. Amen? Now some of us can't fast all day. Get old, you gotta take your medicine. You gotta take your medicine with food. Yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm there. Amen. <laughs> Got some pills you dare not take over here this summer. They'll make you double up. <laughs> don't do that. Amen. That's right. So, so don't worry about it. Take your medicine and fast anyway. Amen? Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is you got to eat, eat your food and then fast through a meal that you normally eat mm -hmm. without taking your medicine. Amen? Mm -hmm. That sound good? That sound like it says? Amen. Mm -hmm. Don't eat your meal. Take your food. All right, we're going to pray now. Yeah. And we're going to be praying persistently for God to continue to bless our church, yeah. to bless the people, to bless our health, to bless our nation, to help our president yes, Lord. that really is a drug that he uses to help his hair grow that is a drug that impacts memory and decision making I'm telling you, I told you all that the other day in church and somebody was mad at it I said anybody call that stuff that we got a problem well <laughs> it is a drug that has been over 1700 lawsuits that say that that drug it does a lot of things. It brings on prostate cancer, it can bring on uh, colon cancer, but it also it can infect your memory, which is one reason why you lie so much. <laughs> but it's not his memory that causes him to lie. And then it is impairs decision making. This is gonna get scarier than it is. And he has sole authority, he does not need Congress, our president does not need Congress to declare war. They gave this to George Bush with 9-11 came. And he, they do not, he does not need Congress to send the missiles up. This is one man who could remove, could take that finger and push start pushing buttons, and nobody can stop it. Do you think we have a reason to pray? We have a very big reason to pray. And we're gonna do it. Amen? And my only question is, when he gets to memory impairment and judgment and decision impairment, who's gonna stop him and sit him down? Amen? Had to be God. Yes. It won't be the Republican Party. Because they want to keep him propped up and leaned up and every kind of up he can be. But until they can get what they want. So they're not going to do anything. But it will be the God who said, who will sit him down. Amen. Let's pray. Amen.